which are on a plot app. Okay, and sorry. I forgot to say I'll be recording this. Um, so got it. If you <clears throat> so as Nir said, we are old colleagues and friends uh, for many years at Suffolk University, and it the work that Nir is doing that UMass is doing through the Center for Applied Ethics is the kind of thing that I'm really excited to see happening in philosophy. So I'm especially pleased to be here with you today. So I have sent near a, a PDF or a, a, an MS Word document, which has the paper, which is the basis for the talk I'm giving today. The paper is far too long to just read to you. And uh, I also think that doing something like this over Zoom by reading a paper would be just deadly. So what I'm going to do is uh, present a PowerPoint, which more or less are, outlines the main features of my uh, presentation. I may move through it fairly quickly, uh, but we can come back in the discussion to address any part of it. You can email near uh, to request a copy of the paper. Uh, the presentation will not follow the paper exactly, uh, but you'll find a deeper discussion of some of the points I'm making in the presentation in the paper if you request it from him. Um, I also, also, although this paper is on Heidegger, I have tried to present it in such a way that those of you who don't have any background in Heidegger will find it accessible. Uh, I hope that will be true, uh, but uh, we'll take it from there. So, oh, and in the chat, I've put in the link for the Mirror of Race project, which has in fact migrated now to Boston College, which is its institutional home and will be further developed at Boston College. All right, so I'm gonna share screen. Um, and so here we go. Everybody could uh, mute themselves for the duration of the presentation. All right. So, a large part of what I'm interested in is what it means to be a teacher at this particular juncture in history. And I'm interested in this question of what ethic is appropriate to a sustainable, welcoming, and what I call polemological pedagogy. And I can explain that later, but it's part of my work. Uh, and I have two quotes here, which I'm not going to go into in detail, but they're they headline the paper that I've given. And it has to do with the question of when we are dealing with extremely divisive issues in a polarizing time, such as we're living in now, how do we deal with that in the classroom? How do we deal with that as individuals who have a role as teachers and as members of our community? Uh, but first, <clears throat> I wanted to just say what that context is. These are some images from the rally and assault on the US Capitol on January 6th in 2021 from the Stop the Steal uh, demonstration, which of course turned into a riot, which turned into a full-on insurrection and attempt to overthrow the government. So I don't think it's useful to mince words about what that was and what it meant and what it means for us and what we have to confront today. And in particular, in uh, recently what's come out is that this man um, on the left here, Giuliani on the right, uh, the, this other man is um, a fellow named Eastman. Uh, I think it's John Eastman. I'm suddenly forgetting his first name. Uh, he's a law professor at the Claremont Institute in California, and he prepared a memo 
for Trump that he discussed with Trump and was discussed with Pence for a strategy for dealing with the January 6th counting of the votes uh, in Congress as part of the formal resolution of the presidential election and that it had six main points. One would be the first being that Pence would start by counting the electoral votes from Alabama. He then gets to Arizona and sets that state aside, rationalizing doing so by the fact that there were electoral votes submitted by the state's Trump electors. And he does the same for six other states for which competing slates then existed. And that was, what was that? Michigan, I think, Pennsylvania, maybe Wisconsin, I'm not sure what the others were. And with all the other votes counted, Pence then declares that the contested states are not to be included. And since Trump won the counted votes, he's reelected. And predicting howls from the Democrats, Pence would then say, fine, let the House decide, decide as is procedure when there's a tie in the Electoral College. And in that case, each state gets one vote according to the Constitution. And given that the Republicans control six of, excuse me, control 26 of the state's representatives, they would win that election by 26 to 24. Uh, and uh, next, they would block any other consideration of competing ballots by using the filibuster process. And furthermore, Pence would give no warning that this would be happening by asking for advanced permission from Congress to do any of this. Uh, this is a, this was discussed with Trump. This was discussed with Pence. Pence took it very seriously. And uh, almost was willing to go along with it, but obviously in the last moment did not. This is a roadmap for a bloodless coup that nearly took place uh, eight months ago and could easily happen again. So what's the, the context for this is what I'm calling the, the new right or the alt-right, uh, nationalist international. And for that, because it's not very much covered in the media, not nearly as much as it should be, uh, I just want to present this for you. Some of you may be familiar with it, but others may need uh, a very rough introduction to the kinds of players we're dealing with. Uh, the new right, what do I mean by the new right? And what does the new right mean by the new right? It means an eclectic mix of reactionary ideologies and movements that generally reject progressive universalism and bourgeois capitalism, but ostensibly reject totalitarian party politics, imperialism, and the genocide of the old right, much as the new left did in the 1960s with the old left. And that encompasses the alt-right, which is the tech and media sav uh, savvy mutation of the new right, often postmodern in its embrace of meme magic, social networking, Dada-esque humor, and poning the libs, intermingled with identitarianism, which is a new right appropriation of progressive identity politics focusing on white identity, or more discreetly, European identity, drawing upon the great replacement theory of Renaud Camus, um, which is taken up in slogans like white genocide and Jews will not replace us. And that is closely related to ethno-nationalism or more discreetly, neo-nationalism, nativism, national populism, and other terms. And that's a nationalist politics grounded upon ethnicity as the basis for national identity, often a euphemism for white nationalism, which is a nationalism grounded in white identity as the basis for separate ethno states, generally a euphemism in itself for white supremacy, 
a hierarchical politics based on white dominance and governance, law, economics, professions, etc. Now, usually a version of neo-fascism, uh, which is fascism adapted to historical and cultural contingencies, often disguising its affiliations to overt fascism. And fascism is a, and this is a very rough and ready definition, a reactionary authoritarian rejection of enlightenment universalism and liberalism, embracing identity grounded in atavistic belonging that can generally only be discovered, not chosen, and that is exclusive, usually aggressively, even violently so, and that typically rejects rule of law, limited government, and human rights, and generally puts its political faith in a supreme leader who represents the will of the nation. And finally, neo-Confederacy, which I define somewhat tongue in cheek as the once and future thing of America's version of fascism. So, uh, so this is just a more pictorial version. Uh, the new right, uh, on the one hand, we have uh, Tucker Carlson. On the other, uh, I'm forgetting her name, a young woman who was known as, what was her name? Uh, gun girl in, at, at the University of Ohio at Kent, uh, who graduated with her AK, uh, not AK-47, AR-15. Uh, the alt-right, Steve Bannon. Uh, here are some identitarians. Uh, American identitarians, German identitarians, ethno-nationalists, white supremacy. I think we're all pretty familiar with what that looks like. Uh, fascism, these are its mid 20th century incarnations, the various fascist movements in, in Europe on the left. Uh, but fascism was a global phenomenon. Uh, Imperial Japan, was a fascist uh, regime. And then neo-fascism, here are some uh, marchers in the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, Charlotte's, yeah, Charlottesville, um, with various symbols of the neo-fascist movement in the United States. And of course, neo-confederacy. Uh, on the left is Kevin Seyfried in the US Capitol. This is a deeply symbolic image, by the way, because on the left here is John Calhoun, the ultra uh, slaver, uh, defender of slavery in American, and Charles Sumner, the abolitionist, and Richard Nixon, who brought the Southern strategy into play for the Republican Party, uh, and, uh, which uh, neo-Confederates think of as Lincoln's worst nightmare. Um, so what does this all have to do with Heidegger? What does the alt-right have to do with Heidegger? Well, many thought leaders on the new right or alt-right either draw on Heidegger or work directly on Heidegger. Far-right political leaders and activists, largely in Europe, but also in the US and elsewhere, draw explicitly or indirectly, indirectly from Heidegger. There is a non-trivial resonance between Heidegger's philosophical involvement with national socialism in the 1930s and the politics of the alt-right. Confronting Heidegger on politics, and this is the more philosophical side of this, uh, may allow us to confront more fully and philosophically the rise of ethno-nationalism in the United States, Europe, and beyond, and confront the concomitant weaknesses of liberal democracy. And finally, the fifth issue, which really is a question to me, about radical hospitality and the absolute welcome. What is our ethical responsibility as educators, both in the classroom with students who are either attracted or threatened by uh, the alt-right and as members of our wider communities during a time of intense polarization? Okay, so 
What I want to do now is give you a, a quick survey of some of the thought leaders on the new right or alt right. So this first came to my attention as a serious phenomenon when Richard Polt and I uh, published the first book in our book series with Roman and Littlefield International, the new Heidegger research book series, the book by Tom Sheehan, Making Sense of Heidegger, a Paradigm Shift. This was back in November of 2014. And Tom sent us the first review that he had come across of his book by somebody named Greg Johnson. It was an online review. It's a 10,000 word review. And Tom had read it quickly and thought we should know about it and maybe send it on to our publisher. Now, because it was so long, I don't think he fully recognized the context of this review. And this is the full page on the website, Greg Johnson's Countercurrents website. If you look a little more closely at it, um, excuse me, you would see that there were books like White Identity Politics and uh, Graduate School with Heidegger. Now, if you weren't looking very closely, you might think that these are cultural studies topics. But if you do look more closely, these are just Johnson's own books that he publishes through counterculture, uh, countercurrents publishing. Um, White Identity Politics, Graduate School with Heidegger, From Plato to Plato, um, Postmodernism, It's Okay to Be White, The White Nationalist Manifesto. This is all part of Johnson's alt-right fiefdom, one of the most important alt-right publishing houses currently in existence, Countercurrents. Now, who is this guy, Greg Johnson? He has his PhD in philosophy from Catholic University in 2000. He wrote his thesis on Kant under Richard Belkley. He's the editor-in-chief of Countercurrents, which publishes multiple authors, translations, reprints of out-of-print works. He himself has authored many monographs and edited many volumes of his own, translated into 16 languages. The Countercurrents website has regular blog posts, podcasts, interviews, guest writers, and interviewers. And in November of 2020, it had nearly 300,000 unique viewers monthly, which means that Greg Johnson is probably the most well-read Heidegger commentator in the world. Just think about that for a moment. And he has extensive nationalist international connections with the Skansa Forum in Oslo, the London Forum, and uh, let me quickly move on. So his work as an international nationalist got him arrested in Norway. He was released. Um, Norway has laws against uh, promulgating violence uh, in politics. So he got in a bit of trouble there. Uh, and so, what about them as political activists, these thought leaders? Well, there's Richard Spencer, uh, who claims to have invented the term alt-right. He has his MA in humanities from the University of Chicago. He began his PhD at Duke, never finished it. He collaborated with Stephen Miller, Trump's future advisor in campus politics at Duke. And he is the chemical founder of Arctos Media, publisher of far-right text, for example, Evola, De Benoit, Dugan, and others. He's an avowed white nationalist and neo-Nazi. He advocates peaceful ethnic cleansing to create white ethnostates, and he was one of the major organizers of the Unite the Right rally. Uh, Steve Bannon, co-founder of Breitbart News as the platform for the alt-right, has cited the Italian fascist Giulia Evola and the Russian neo-fascist Alexander Dugin as intellectual influences for his own organicist traditionalism. He's proclaimed of Heidegger under the influence of Dugin, that's my guy. Uh, as you all probably know, he was the campaign director and then White House advisor to Donald Trump. 
and mentor to Stephen Miller. Uh, and he calls, he's a right-wing Bolshevist, I would say. And he has said, I am a Leninist. Lenin wanted to destroy the state and that's my goal too. I want to bring everything crashing down and destroy all of today's establishment. Stephen Miller, active in politic, campus politics at Duke with Richard Spencer. And he wrote Trump's 2018 speech for the UN. And I want you to keep this language in mind for when we get to Heidegger. America is governed by Americans. We reject the ideology of globalism and we embrace the doctrine of patriotism. Around the world, responsible nations must defend against threats to sovereignty, not just from global governance, but also from other new forms of coercion and domination. Martin Zellner, leader of the identitarian movement of Austria. He studied philosophy at Vienna, credits his mature thinking to Heidegger inspired and probably met with Brenton Tarrant who murdered 51 Muslims in two mosques in New Zealand in 2019. Uh, Mark Jongen wrote his dissertation on Heidegger under Peter Sloterdijk in Germany, elected to the Bundestag uh, on the Alternative for Deutschland, Germans, Germany's neo-nationalist party uh, considered the house philosopher of the AfD, and he incorporates Heideggerian tropes in his political speeches and other uh, outreach. All right, so part three, Heidegger and the alt-right, a non-trivial resonance in the nationalist international. And in November of 1933, Adolf Hitler, put forward a plebiscite to the German nation, asking the German people to vote yes or no on two things, very simply, Hitler's domestic policy and Hitler's foreign policy. <laughs> uh, and Hitler's foreign policy involved leaving the League of Nations as one of its main points, right? And that implied leaving the entire regime of oversight that the allied powers had set up over Germany after the First World War to constrain their remilitarization. So this is Heidegger's speech, which was broadcast on the radio. Voting to leave the League of Nations is not a turning away from the community of nations. On the contrary, with this step, our people is submitting to that essential law of human existence to which every people must first give allegiance if it is still to be a people. It is only out of the parallel observance by all peoples of this unconditional demand of self-responsibility that there emerges the possibility of taking one another seriously so that a community of nations can be affirmed. It is not ambition, not desire for glory, not blind obstinacy and not hunger for power that demands from the Fuhrer that Germany withdraw from the League of Nations. It is only the clear will to unconditional self-responsibility in enduring and mastering the fate of our people. And this is just some more from that same speech. I think this language is very significant. The will to a true community of nations is equally far removed both from an unrestrained, vague desire for world brotherhood and from blind tyranny existing beyond this opposition. This will allows peoples and states to stand by one another in an open and manly fashion as self-reliant entities. The choice that the German people will now make is simply as an event in itself and independent of the outcome, the strongest evidence of the new German reality embodied by the national socialist state. Our will to national self-responsibility desires that each people find and preserve the greatness and truth of its particular purpose. This will is the highest guarantee of security among peoples for it binds itself to the basic law of manly respect 
and unconditional honor. So there's a lot to unpack there. We can come back to it if anyone wants. But uh, here I want to give you what I take to be Heidegger's most concentrated statement of his politics as proceeding from Heidegger's interpretation of the history of the question of being in Western philosophy since Plato. And this is from a lecture course to introductory, an introductory lecture course he gave at the University of Freiburg in the fall of 1933. So he says, if one interprets Plato's ideas as representations and thoughts that contain a value, a norm, a law, a rule, such that ideas then become conceived of as norms, then the one subject to these norms is the human being, not the historical human being, but rather the human being in general, the human being in itself or humanity. These are not compliments coming from Heidegger. Here, that is in Platonism in all its forms, which includes almost everything from Christianity to Hegel to Marx for Heidegger, the conception of the human being is one of a rational being in general. In the Enlightenment and in liberalism, this conception achieves a definite form. Here, all of the powers against which we, that is Germany under the National Socialist regime, must struggle today have their root. Opposed to this conception are the finitude, temporality, and historicity of human beings. All right, so I think that's pretty straightforward. It's not too bad in terms of its Heidegger jargon, uh, and we can come back to it if people want. Um, so what I think this all points to in the nationalist international is a multiculturalism between nations, but not within them. It is precisely this conceit of an anti-universalist community na of nations in the nationalist international that the modern new right has latched onto in its reading of Heidegger. At its most subtle, this position can present itself as an appeal to distinct identity without relying on race, only on the right of each historical people to the self-assertion of its own ethno-identity within a bounded territory. It is what allows someone like Greg Johnson to proclaim that, quote, we believe that all peoples should have sovereign homelands where they can live according to their own rights, lights, excuse me, free from the interference of other peoples, or someone like Richard Spencer to claim that this respectful separation might be achieved by, this is quoting him, peaceful ethnic cleansing. And Greg Johnson, to unite the, the nationalist international and his interest in Heidegger said this in a speech to the London Forum in 2017. The London Forum is a, a gathering for far right uh, intellectuals and movement leaders. Heidegger's conclusion in being in time is that all cognitive activities, even those of philosophy and science are made possible by language and other social practices that are learned ultimately by participation in a community that is particular, not universal, changing, not eternal, provincial, not cosmopolitan. In other words, at the root of every cognitive act is ethnic identity. In Heidegger's words, I believe there is no essential work of the spirit that does not have its root in originary autochthony, Autochthony, just in case you don't know the word, means springing from one's own native soil. Thus, contrary to Plato and other Greek philosophers, I'm continuing with Johnson, deracination, that is an escape from the cave of finitude into a universal timeless domain, is not the path to wisdom, but the path to the folly of nihilism, which is playing itself out today on the global stage. So uh, now let me move to Alexander Dugin, uh, who is a main figure in the promulgation of Heidegger as the touchstone philosopher for 
the nationalist international. So Dugan, uh, born in 1962, he is not quite Putin's brain has been, as has often been reported, but he is deeply enmeshed in Russian politics and intellectual life. He is also deeply involved across the globe with the alt-right Nationalist International. He is the co-founder in the 1990s of the Red Brown National Bolshevik Party. And he has extensive publications on Heidegger and politics, and he is an avid occultist and practitioner of chaos magic, which the alt-right refers to as meme magic, and may have a chance to talk more about that later. Dugan's most important work on this topic is called the fourth political theory. And Dugan proclaims a fourth political theory in his book of that title to usher in Heidegger's other inception, a new beginning to history to sweep away the nihilism of, the, of millennia since Plato. The fourth political theory transcends and sublates the three preceding ones in modernity, according to Dugan, liberalism, communism, and fascism. These prior three had each in their own way elevated the human being as a subject as the agent of politics and history that only entrenched Platonic nihilism deeper in modernity. In liberalism, that subject is the isolated individual. In communism, that subject is class, especially the working class. In fascism or Nazism, that subject is the race or the state as the embodiment of the race. Uh, uh, <clears throat> And drawing on Heidegger's critique of biological racism, Dugan argues that racism as a form of modernist subjectivism can be purged from national socialist ideology. And now quoting Dugan, without racism, national socialism is no longer national socialism, either theoretically or practically, and becomes harmless and decontaminated. We can now proceed without fear to analyze it objectively in search of those ideas within it that could be integrated into the fourth political theory. So Nazism purged as ethno-nationalism. For Dugan, the core, if repressed idea of national socialism after purging its racism is a positive attitude toward the ethnos, an ethnocentrism. Dugan describes the ethnos in this way as a cultural phenomenon, as a community of language, religious belief, daily life, the sharing of resources and goals, an organic entity written into an accommodating landscape as a refined system for constructing models for married life. So um, no LGBTQ plus here, please. As an always unique means of establishing a relationship with the outside world, as the matrix of the life world, here he draws on Edwin Husserl, and as the source of all the language games, drawing on Ludwig Wittgenstein. So here we get into a little bit of Heideggerian terminology. For Heidegger, Dasein is the word for the kind of being that we human beings are, a being that is capable of asking self-reflectively the question of the meaning of, meaning of being, of interrogating its own interpretive structures and historicity. We are Dasein. So for Dugan, Heidegger provides the best philosophical basis for the ontology of the ethnos as Dasein, a revolutionary for Dugan conception of being human beyond modernist subjectivity. Heidegger's Dasein is no longer a platonizing subject that imposes its will to power on history as the atomistic individual of liberalism, the class to end all classes in communism, or the master race of Nazism. By contrast, writes Dugan, liberalism as an ideology, calling for the liberation of all forms of collected identity in general is entirely incompatible with the ethnos and ethnocentrism. 
and is an expression of a systematic theoretical and technological ethnocide. This is the basis for Dugin's and by extension Putin's and Russia's decolonialist championing of Eurasianism against Western style liberalism or what Dugin calls Atlanticism. For Dugin, Atlanticism is the form that liberalism takes as global imperialism, first with Britain, now with the United States as its champion. All right, decolonialism on the alt-right, who would have thought? As do many on the new right, Dugan seeks to appropriate the arguments of anti and decolonialism on the left to serve the neo-nationalism of the right where Russia represents the forces of rootedness and organicism, and America the forces of deracination and the nihilistic devastation of the earth. Against univer liberal universalism and cultural, economic, political, neo-colonialism, this other inception to history would usher in an age of what Dugan calls pluriversalism. This directly mirrors Heidegger's notion that Hitler's goal of ending the liberal cosmopolitan League of Nations would not bring on an age of barbarism, but rather a true community of nations, a multiculturalism between nations, although not within them. Uh, so I'm, I may rush through this. Uh, um, So there's probably too much here to go over in detail. My main point is that Dugan thinks that the fourth political theory can sublate, that is deconstruct and take over what is positive out of communism and fascism into this fourth political theory, but that in its sublation of liberalism, what the fourth political theory does is entirely annihilate liberalism into its opposite by negating the liberal concept of freedom uh, in order to allow a completely new conception of freedom to arise. And this is why I think his claim that the fourth political theory adopts a fascism purged of racism rings hollow because ethno-nationalism as opposed to white nationalism, as opposed to neo-fascism and white supremacy are all distinctions without much of a difference apart from the rhetoric of political propaganda designed to deceive the casual observer. <clears throat> all right. So, I mean, we can see this from Dugan's own red brown meme magic. Uh, again, I can explain more about what meme magic is later. Uh, this was the logo of Dugin's National Bolshevik Party in the 1990s, and it is directly modeled on the Reichadler of the Nazi Party. And so now I, I'm going to try to end quickly as I can on confronting Heidegger and the alt-right for the polemical ethics of a reconstruction of liberalism. What's the difference between philosophy and ideology? And I, I'm asking these as open questions, but I have some hints to what I think about it. In politics, are we really prepared to defend our commitments philosophically rather than ideologically? What would that difference even look like? If philosophy entails absolute freedom, would that difference not mean leaving oneself open to challenging one's own most cherished commitments without ideological repression of the hard questions. But can we really sustain this openness to errants without losing ourselves and our bearings for ethical responsibility? What if we don't have a choice though in this age of polarization? What if liberalism, whatever it means at its most noble, has fallen victim to a hollowness that comes from the laziness and smugness of defenses made too often ideologically rather than philosophically after our now 250 something years since the enlightenment. 
So my view, and this is just an assertion, is that liberalism must renew itself philosophically and meta-politically. And I can say more about what I mean by that. So again, just a reminder about the stop to steal rally and assault on the Capitol. Um, you know, this is something wicked still on its way, still arriving. Our American experiment nearly ended in January. Most Republicans in Congress supported efforts to overturn the election. Most Republicans in Congress will still not refute the big lie that the election was stolen. And most Republican voters believe that lie. And there's even now some polling to suggest that they would support violence uh, as a way to assert uh, their political allegiance. Republican state legislatures are now attempting to pass scores of laws to repress undesirables votes and to set up the possibility of those state legislators overturning slates of electors voted by the people to substitute their own electors in the next presidential election. <laughs> Republicans are more and more explicitly ex embracing the language of ethno-nationalism and Jim Crow politics. For example, Tucker Carlson has actively promoted the great replacement theory on his show. And so in my view, we are just one congressional election and one presidential election away from the imposition of minority rule and a new Jim Crow in the United States. And I hope I am being uh, um, a chicken little about that, but given everything I'm seeing, uh, I don't think it's uh, crying wolf. So I think what we're seeing now is an America lifting the mask of its identity. And this is a real flag that was flying in Rocky Mount, Virginia in March, 2021 the flag of a, showing a white hand pulling away the American flag to reveal the Confederate flag as its underpinning. I mean, what better symbolic, it's not even a metaphor, declaration of the true identity of the American uh, experiment from the view of the alt-right and the new right. Uh, the day of the rope. This is a long standing far right uh, imagery from the Turner Diaries. Uh, that this was a, a, um, a scaffold erected on the at the Stop the Steal event. Um, and I'm gonna rush through this last bit because it's just presenting my questions really about what it is that's left to us as teachers of philosophy in the classroom as our responsibility. So I give you the strange case of Michael Millerman, who was a PhD student at the University of Chicago, uh, Toronto. He is a Zionist Jew, but who has translated several of Alexander Dugin's work, including the fourth political theory, and has published with Arctos Media, the neo, fascist neo-Nazi outfit co-directed by Richard Spencer. He wrote his dissertation on Dugan, Strauss, Rorty, and Derrida, which caused a rift with his conservative supervisor, Clifford Orwin. And Ruth Marshall considers herself left of liberal, took over supervision saying, I feel just in principle that we shouldn't have ideological tests of our students. I think this is a problem that more of us will begin to face in the coming years. Uh, what do we do when we have a student like Michael Miller? What is our responsibility? In the classroom, do we extend an absolute welcome to all students, even those whose views we find abhorrent? And to what end? What about students in the classroom who might feel threatened by such people? What is our responsibility of welcome for them? What are the rules of guest friendship, what the Greeks called xenia, that would allow the welcome to endure or require that it end? And is there a way that the absolute welcome of the classroom may model the kind of citizenship we need? 
or our classroom and the public sphere to very different kinds of ethical space. In supervising doctoral work, for those of us who are professors who are working with PhD students, what happens when we get a Millerman wanting to work with us? As scholars who publish work in this area, I have not sought to publish this paper I've sent to you because I'm not sure I want to be publicly turning over rocks best left alone. If truly something wicked this way is, in, is coming and indeed has in part arrived, do we have the responsibility to try to turn this stranger aside into the conversation of guest friendship? And I, I take as my model here, Daryl Davis. Uh, Daryl Davis is a musician. Uh, some of you may know his name. If you just Google him, he's given TED Talks. There's a film about him. He meets with and befriends members of the KKK. And he has a room in his house full of the KKK robes of men whom he has befriended who have left the KKK and donated their robes to him. So there is room for this absolute welcome. I just wonder what its limits are. So I will leave it at that for now. Uh, and I'll stop the screen share and we can have a conversation. Thank you, Greg. That was really great. And uh, I will let people raise their hands and uh, call on you as I see you. So please, uh, Chris, hi, go ahead. Chris Zern. Oh, you went too quickly for me. Um, thanks. For, I did. Uh, I, I'm sorry. No, no, not you, Greg. I, uh, um, I'm near. Um, that was a great paper, Greg. I have a lot of stuff in there, just a ton of different content. I don't want to uh, speak to it all. I guess I just want to ask sort of two sort of general questions about the thrust of the paper. Um, one is about the taxonomy of the alt-right, and I take it that that is partly educational, right? Just trying to get everybody who's in the right group but then it's not really a taxonomy. And at the end of the paper, you say it's sort of distinctions without a difference. We've just got labels that are trying to sort of hide the ball a little bit from mainstream press, um, as it were. So I, I'm wondering about the status of that taxonomy. Is it a taxonomy or is it really kind of more just like a, a listing of everybody in the zoo? Um, so that, that's one question. That's a pretty straightforward question. The other question is about the broad thrust of what you call, I like this phrase, the nationalist international. And I like the way that you brought out the internationalist thing, because originally I was like, well, it's not an international, but I think you've made the case there. Um, but the theme of a kind of, um, what was Dugan's phrase, pluriversalism? Pluriversalism. Pluriversalism is really just warmed over Herder. Right. I mean, it's, yes. it's in some ways just what the 19th century delivered to us. It's nothing really specific to Heidegger, maybe one might say. I mean, I think it's deeply in Heidegger, so I don't want to argue about that part. <laughs> I'm, I'm more skeptical of Heidegger than you are. But um, I, I do think that 19th century ethno-nationalism is deeply embedded in Heidegger. But that seems to me sort of just like, you know, the lint he picked up on his feet while he was going through his German Bildung. Right. In some ways, it was just the the the, the intellectual uh, uh, seas that he's swimming in, and as he's learning his trade craft in the early 20th century. Because really, from Herder on, for another 120 years, you get an endless development of this very specific idea that every nation, every natio, every people, every gens has a sort of unique talent to give to the world. And in order to realize that talent, they have to internally cleanse themselves and separate themselves into little contrasting enclaves so that they can deliver their truth to the next one. You even get it in you know, Du Bois's conservation of races in, what is that, 1893 or something like that. So it's not really a Heideggerian theme. Dugan might be using Heidegger to put that theme forward you, you get the point of my sort of, I just want more sort of 
how much is this a Heidegger thing? How much is this a uh, Heidegger as a charismatic writer who people get really into and have a good time, you know, explaining to other people or something like that? that that's really the, the, the thrust of the question I'm more interested in. Thanks. All right. So let me answer your first question about taxonomy. I think, first of all, there is an educational aspect to this. I, I think the American people are, are very ill-informed about the alt-right and what they call themselves and how they label themselves. And, uh, you know, they have their differences among themselves. Uh, and, it, you know, it's a bit like, you know, 19th century communism where there are all kinds of battling tiny little thises and thats that have different angles and different takes on it. And it's extremely bewildering for those who stand on the outside of it. I do think that there are real differences among them, but the general overarching tendency, I agree with you, is that many of these are distinctions without a difference in the final analysis. And a lot of it is a disguise in the American context where outright ethno-nationalism, racism, and so on is still, you know, even after Trump, you can't do it quite openly. So I think it's important to, to know how they name themselves, but we have to also be able to say what this is tending to, which is a form of neo-fascism in our time. We're really on the cusp of that. We're fascism adjacent. Uh, and uh, that is very worrisome to me. All right, your second question. Uh, I think you're right, absolutely, that this is a, an intellectual phenomenon that's at least as old as Herder. And uh, it is why I think it is the problem of our of our age is how do we reconcile the universalism of the enlightenment and the classical liberal project as flawed as it was in many ways how do we reconcile that universalism with the particularity of human belonging to uh, language to place to culture to tradition i think there's a head-on collision between those two things that is at issue for the whole planet right now and figuring out a way to deal with that constructively rather than destructively is what's at issue for what i call reconstructive liberalism or a rethinking of liberalism because liberalism has fallen asleep at the wheel it has not dealt with this problem sufficiently well at the meta-political, meta-ethical level uh, of its deep roots. I don't think you're gonna get there through John Rawls. I think it needs something more serious and more profound in order to meet this challenge. As much of respect as I have for John Rawls, I was my teacher as an undergraduate. So, um, so for me, Heidegger, is important, first of all, because he is a figure that is taken up by the nationalist international as the thinker or one of the major thinkers uh, for what they're driving at. But also because Heidegger exposes what's metapolitically at stake all the way back to Plato in the Western tradition. I don't agree with Heidegger's reading of Plato but I do think he's right that what's at stake are philosophical questions about universalism and particularism, particularism that stretch back all the way to Plato's ideas and how the ideas relate to the particulars of our lived experience. So for that reason, I find Heidegger useful as a, uh, as a foil for the reconstruction of liberalism that I'm interested in. I hope that answers your question, Chris. But, you know, Herder is a very interesting example because he's not, he's not a proto-fascist. 
And in some ways, he, he's trying to articulate the problem that I've just mentioned of saying, you know, there, there is some universal conversation we want to be having, but in order to have it, we each have to be able to speak for ourselves and know ourselves. And, and, he, and he doesn't have that 19th century purifi internal purification of the language and culture that obsession that comes only later, I think, in the 19th century. Yes, that sort of paranoia about purification is a late 19th century development that becomes pathological and truly nihilistic in the 20th century. So I think Herder is putting his finger on things that make Herder a very interesting figure in this. Um, and you're right to cite Du Bois. I'm very interested in Du Bois because I think we see the same thing happening in Du Bois. And we feel great sympathy for Du Bois. Uh, I do. I understand what he's driving at, but uh, I don't see him as a villain in this story. I see him as touching on the central nerve of our time and trying to come up with a way of addressing it. Um, you know, he, he became pretty depressed about the, pro, about the prospects of a solution by the end of his life. I mean, he moved to Ghana and left the United States. So, but not everyone is as pessimistic as I think Du Bois became. So let's hear from uh, Steve, then Jeff, then uh, Olivier. Hi, thanks for a great talk. Um, I, I was going to ask about the role of Heidegger, but since it's already been done, I'll, I'll come at it from a little slightly different angle, but still a Heidegger kind of question. I mean, one thing that is sticks out as different between Heidegger and the alt-right is their tone, mm. let's say. And maybe tone doesn't matter that much. Um, but in, in the sense of the Dadaist aspect of the alt-right, the trolling, the kind of play, you know, playing on the edge of meaning, not meaning, and so on. And of course, Heidegger is, is known for a kind of kitschy sincerity, we could say almost. Um, and, and maybe this doesn't matter because of course, the Nazi party also had those features of the alt-right. And I'm just wondering about the relationship of these two tones, as it were, if there is any, or if there's, if there's anything important there at all. It's a really, really good question. So if you read a lot of Heidegger in the 1930s, it's very hard to find anything that is vulgar in tone, right? Even his most dangerous pronouncements are made in very exalted abstract language. And even when he's attacking the Jews, it's not done in this, you know, the Gregor Strasse pornographic way, right? Sort of anti-Semitic pornography that was very common in, in I mean, I mean pornography in a in a, a loose sense. Uh, so, you know, Heidegger tried to remain an intellectual, part of an intellectual nobility. And I'm sure he did, he, he detested what he saw as national socialist vulgarity. But at the same time, fascist movements are populist movements. And they have no other way to mobilize but to mobilize along those lines, which is exactly what we're seeing now. I mean, my favorite example of this, I'm going to go back to sharing my screen and give you one of them from my talk uh, that I collected for the end of the talk. Um, so Pepe the Frog is an aspect of the meme magic of the alt-right. Pepe the Frog is a character who was made by a cartoonist in the early 2000s. He's a kind of laid back slacker, you know, feels good man. Uh, he, he's sort of slightly depressive, but the alt-right seized on this figure of Pepe and converted him into this Dada-esque figure. So, I mean, here's a, an example, Pepe the Frog, 
uh, on the day of the rope, which is from the Turner Diaries, the day when the insurgents start massacring people of color and their white sympathizers across the United States. And the idea of meme magic, which goes back to the chaos magic of Aleister Crowley, and I mean, it's a really weird <laughs> filiations there, but the idea is that you can create these memes, these visual cues that can infect the political culture and change the world. So the alt-right meme magicians were absolutely delighted when Donald Trump himself, excuse me, took up the Pepe the Frog meme and put it into his own feed, right? Uh, so Trump as Pepe the Frog. And uh, the Pepe the Frog meme has gone way deep. This is, this is the uh, storming of the Capitol. This is the national flag of the People's Republic of Kekistan, right? And it is modeled on the Nazi Germany's war flag, where the four clover leaves of 4chan, where Pepe the Frog emerged as a, a meme, mirror the old Iron Cross, and Kek uh, mirrors the, the, um, the swastika. The idea is that Pepe the Frog is actually the incarnation of the ancient Egyptian god, frog god, Kek, who is a god of chaos and darkness. So here they are, I mean, going from a cartoon figure to storming the capital as a symbol of neo-fascism. This is how they mobilize the youth. And we, you know, people of my generation, it's, it flies under the radar entirely for us, but it's there. And it's a powerful thing for people. And it's, it's among our students, even if we don't know it. So how do you balance the exalted Heideggerian tone with the Dada-esque Pepe the Frog tone? The alt-right wants to finesse that. They want to be able to do both at the same time. And that, you know, and if they can, that, that is their path to power. Just like it was for the new left in the 1960s, which failed, but the new right sees itself very much in the model of the new left of the 1960s using the same methods to gain political and meta-political influence. Uh, Jeff? Jeff, your sound. Still muted. No, okay. Yes, Greg, outstanding work you're doing. And I would, absolutely beg you get this thing published <laughs> you've been on my case to publish my story i'm going to be on your case to publish this <laughs> yeah, but you don't have my wife <laughs> <laughs> but it's 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 important that you've really done you've pulled it together yeah because some well, of you, thank you listening may not know, I came out of this world. I was involved in political movements that led to this. And, uh, I, and I've been starting to speak out about it. I even gave a talk at the JFK library this past summer about it. Yeah. But yeah. this idea of how do we deal with it in the classroom? I, I've been struggling with this for, for some time now. And an incident took place. And I wonder if I did the right thing. About four years ago, I had a student in one of my, uh, in my ethics and social life class, and it's ethics and civic life class, who started to spout off uh, anti-Holocaust stuff, that the Holocaust was a Jewish hoax, et cetera. I cut him off. I 
firmly put my foot down. I say, that is not welcome in this classroom and I'm not gonna allow you one second to dispute this nonsense. Some people have told me, you know, he tried to say to me, well, there's two sides of every story. And he said, not to this one. And I've been, and as you know, Greg, for years I've been complaining about the, the need for a liberalism with teeth. Because <clears throat> the thing I have noticed in the part of people of a more liberal or progressive disposition is precisely this is under their radar. They haven't seen it. And uh, I'm like you, I'm frightened by this. Did I do the right thing? Should I have put my foot down like that? What are you, you doing know, in the classroom? I, I think it depends on each teacher and what they see to be the limits of their strength and the needs of the other students in that classroom, mm -hmm. right? Because it's not just that student who is at issue. It's the other students too. So I wouldn't fault you for what you decided to do. And it reminds me of Frederick Douglass's 4th of July speech where he says, you know, well, what would you have me do? Would you have me debate with the slaveholder that slavery is wrong? I mean, aren't we past that at this point, right? Uh, and I think there is something to that. But, you know, even Frederick Douglass went to and met with his former owner and tried to find a way to reconcile and bring him out of himself. So I think there are sacred places for where the absolute welcome can happen. But I think the teacher is entitled to say what what the rules of hospitality in their classroom are. Mm -hmm. what, you know, in the ancient world, both the Greek world and the world of the, of the Bible, hospitality was a near absolute. You allowed the stranger into your tent, you gave them to drink and food, but there were still rules, <laughs> you know, they couldn't just yeah. take whatever they wanted and assault you and so on like Paris who ran away with Helen from, uh, from Sparta, that was a violation of hospitality. So I think each teacher needs to be very mindful about what the rules of engagement and welcome are. And each teacher needs to know for themselves what they are capable of and what their particular room of students is capable of. And that's something I discuss with my students just so that we can try to have some kind of social understanding together of what the rules of hospitality are, to try to get them as far out as possible, but they need to be set somewhere. Is that a helpful answer? Yeah, it is great. And thank you so much. It requires phronesis, it requires practical wisdom, but I don't think there's a there's no formula for it. There, there might be rules of thumb, but I don't- It's think kind of like how I dealt with the YAF group on campus a few years ago at Suffolk. Um, you know, I shut down the anti-Semite in my classroom, but I invited the YAF leaders out for a beer. Right. And- I think that's the way. Yeah. Let me, let me go to another question yeah. so we have time. Olivier and then uh, Jake. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hello. Thank you very much for this uh, very, very interesting talk. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm always a fan of talks when Heidegger is being uh, uh, connected to uh, Nazism. And um, I, I have a, a comment and maybe it's also a question about when you connected this different far right and uh, uh, groups to one another. And it came to my mind that um, you, you mentioned also the, the European ones and one I was uh, uh, I'm missing in, in, as an example and uh, that I would like to highlight now is the Swiss party, the SVP, the Schweizer Volkspartei. Um, and I think it might be an interesting example for you, um, uh, for your project because um, 
the SVP meets yearly with the AfD, the Alternative for Deutschland, um, and they put forward very controversial initiatives in Switzerland. Um, and um, yet they are the most, uh, they have the most seats in the Swiss parliament. So they are also uh, doing a lot of governmental work. And I, I just want to share my screen quickly with yes. you. I think you have to ask Nir for permission. Oh. Um, are they the ones who came up with the anti-mosque Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly, for example. And I just wanted to show you one uh, commercial that they do. So for example, here they made two sorts of sheep. One, the white ones are on the Swiss border, on the Swiss part, right? Because of the cross. And then you have the black ones that are on the other side and the white one kicks the black one out and they basically say uh, finally um, mm -hmm. provide safety uh, yes to Ausschaffung krimineller Ausländer so vote yes to to Ausschaffung would be uh, I don't know uh, criminal uh, foreigners what's the one with the yellow black and brown sheep and then the white sheep outside this one oh yeah that's an anti -SVP. that's an anti exactly and that's what <laughs> Exactly. And, and okay, this is it. I just wanted to show you this as an example to yeah, no, thank uh, you. How, how they what they do. But I think it could be interesting because on the one hand, um, the Swiss model is, don't forget Switzerland is this direct democracy. So it seems to be that sometimes direct democracy seem, seems to be the reason why they are there in the first place. But then it's also interesting to look at it because there's a lot of movement against the SVP uh, and they cannot bring every initiative through and so on. So it's, I think it's an, an interesting example to, to look at where you don't want to go. You don't want to have these far white parties being part of your government that strong. But on the other hand, how it's also interesting how to see how the Swiss deal with it since more than 20 years that they have this party there. Like if you compare it, for example, to the, the AfD in Germany, the, the, the other parties exclude the AfD much more than, 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 than in Switzerland, they do it with the S4P. So I was just thinking about this example. That's interesting. Uh, and, yeah. you, and you think that that's partially the responsibility of the more direct democracy of Switzerland. Well, I'm not an expert on this, and I, and I don't know the literature on this. Okay. So it's just well, my. I, I thank you, and I will look into it. It's just it's my personal example. Yeah, but what I'd say about maybe, it, without knowing much, is simply that it it underlines the necessity of citizens actually taking up these questions and thinking them seriously through, and not just having a merely ideological reaction. You know, I'm all in favor of being opposed to these political parties, but if it's simply knee-jerk without thinking through why this is happening and what the larger historical questions are that are motivating it, it's, it's not going to be successful. So that's my larger concern philosophically. And well, um, let me just add to this, um, um, what you can see with the SVP in Switzerland is that once they are part of the government and they are basically forced to, to do governmental work, um, you can see also how they split up, how some that are, were very radical become much more moderate over time and even leave the party to some extent. And you, you also see a clear difference between SVP in the cities and SOP on the this classical city um, um, uh, um, rural divide rural yeah. thank you <laughs> rural uh, division so yeah that's well that's always an issue of whether revolutions radicalize or not and in what you're describing is one that becomes institutionalized but the thought leaders on the alt right want genuine revolution. You know, S Spencer wants ethnic cleansing, right? So there's not really a good way to moderate that. Um, so the danger is when groups like that actually come into power and the radicals actually gain the upper hand, then they end up purging people 
who have those moderate tendencies. And that's when the dynamics of, of really dangerous purging start taking place, both internal and external enemies. You know, like uh, Stalin with the Trotskyites and so on. Who's, is Jake next? Jake. Hey, Carol. Thank you, Olivier. Yes, I hope you can hear me. Uh, Greg, okay. really interesting talk. I, I really enjoyed it. And I've done a little bit of research into similar topics actually with Nier uh, over the past year. So this was very uh, enlightening. Um, one of the questions I did have for you is at the uh, near the end of the presentation, uh, you mentioned that it's very possible that liberalism, broadly construed democratic liberalism, needs some kind of philosophical or meta-ethical um, kind of rejuvenation, um, or it may need that in order to handle uh, these sorts of um, backlashes, pushbacks from uh, sources like the alt-right. One of the questions I guess I have, and maybe in the vein of Du Bois, who you mentioned, is it does seem as though identitarianism, broadly speaking, whether it come from the right, the left, or somewhere else entirely, um, is that this kind of fundamental tension with the liberal democratic project? And I just wondered if you could, if you had any insights or thoughts about what would such a rethinking philosophical rejuvenation, you know, what, what elements might that have? Or is there just a fundamental tension between these two? Well, uh, I just published a book. <laughs> <laughs> called Towards a Polemical Ethics, um, where I begin to sketch out what I think is involved in that. And it's where I take on Heidegger's reading of Plato as the arch liberal, weirdly enough, right? But I actually take him seriously on that front. And I try to defend Plato uh, against Heidegger in order to set up what I take to be a metapolitical reconstruction of liberalism, which is the next leg of the project. So if you want to see more in depth what I try to articulate there, that's one place where I, I, I start to try to do that. But uh, I do think it has to do very, very bluntly, uh, crudely with what I think is a a fundamental human paradox in, in what it means to be human, which is to be both, how would I, I, I use the metaphor of being both earthbound and skybound. We are both deeply connected, linked, rooted to the sense of belonging and meaning that we get from our historical particularity, the language, the culture, and so on, that that we grow up within, even if we dislike it, it's still part of who we are, right? And it, it gives us the world of meaning. Yet at the same time, there's something about being human, and this is what I think is important and against the alt-right, that to be human also means to be capable of transcending that rootedness. But in my view, always for the purpose, the transcending always is for the purpose of returning back to earth and reconstituting your world in a better way. So I think this, what I call uh, polemical hermeneutic between our rootedness and our capacity to transcend our rootedness is what liberalism has to come to grips with much more fully in order to come up with a metapolitics that's capable of addressing what the alt-right is touching the nerve of that's going on all over the world right now. And it, it's not just Europe. It's, you see this in South America, you see it in India, you see it in uh, Myanmar. It, it, it's happening everywhere because of what globalism, which is a form of the universalization of the human, of the human being, is doing to people's sense of local traditional belonging. So how are we going to finesse the local with the global? Uh, that's what we have to be thinking through in terms of an understanding of what it means to be human. So. Go to that's that. Very 
Yeah, um, if you don't mind sharing it, or maybe I can grab it from someone. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll send it. Again, anyone who wants the paper, email me. Uh, Greg, we don't have a ton of time left. If I could uh, offer a question uh, of my own. Um, what do you think of the possibility that there's limits to how much rejuvenation liberalism uh, is capable of structurally while still staying liberalism? Uh, in other words, I think we may have uh, talked about this uh, uh, over the years. There's that great review uh, of uh, Mein Kampf by Orwell in 1940, yeah. before uh, you know the entire uh, world was to uh, finally and completely find out what Hitler was about. And Orwell writes there that, uh, well, actually, I can share it quickly. It's a very short, um, it's a short paragraph. So he says, also he, this is, do people see that? Yeah. Uh, so this is the end of the uh, review. He says, also he, Hitler, grasped the falsity of the hedonistic attitude to life. Nearly all Western thought since the last war, certainly all progressive thought assumed tacitly that human beings desire nothing beyond ease, security, and avoidance of pain. In such a view of life, there's no room, for instance, for patriotism and the martial virtues. The socialist who finds his children playing with soldiers is usually upset, but he's never able to think of a substitute for the tin soldiers. Tin pacifists somehow won't do. <laughs> Hitler, because in his own joyless mind, he feels it with exceptional strength, knows that human beings don't only want comfort, safety, short working hours, hygiene, birth control, and in general, common sense. They also intermittently want struggle, self-sacrifice, not to mention drums, flags, and loyalty parades. However, they may be as economic theories, fascism and Nazism are psychologically sounder than any hedonistic conception of life. The same is probably true of Stalin's militarized version of socialism. All three of the great dictators have enhanced their power by imposing intolerable burdens on their people. Whereas socialism and even capitalism in a more grudging way have said to people, I offer you a good time. Hitler has said to them, I offer you struggle, danger, and death. And as a result, the whole nation flings itself at its feet. Perhaps later they will get sick of it and change their minds. As at the end of the last war, after a few years of slaughter and starvation, greatest happiness for the greatest number is a good slogan. But at this moment, better an end with horror than a horror without end is a winner. Now that we're fighting against the man who coined it, we ought not to underestimate its emotional appeal. So I guess my uh, my question was, um, you know, what kind of reconstructed liberalism could ever match the emotional appeal of that? And should it really try? Or should its emotional appeal be, here's what we'll never try to do? Well, I don't think it can match that particular emotional appeal, but I think there is truth to the fact that human beings are not always going to be satisfied with, you know, brave new worlds, um, you know, three square meals a day and birth control and you're, you know, you're done for the rest of your life. That, that's not going to satisfy everyone. But the good news is that human beings are always gonna have challenges that they need to face. And the human species on this planet will always have challenges. Do those challenges have to be in the form of enemies that are other human beings? I think that's ultimately the question. Uh, and I think that most human beings do not need to gear their lives around making enemies of a class of another human being. But they do need meaning in their lives. However, when people are at a loss for meaning and are afraid, they can be galvanized into meaning by the forging of enemies. So I think we can find larger meaning without the extremity of what Orwell is rightly pointing to here as, as the siren song of extremist political movements, whether on the far, far left or the far, far right. Uh, and what both of those kinds of movements have to their benefit is that they appeal to the side of human nature that wants to transcend itself. It just channels it into the most destructive direction possible. 
So I think liberalism needs to think about how we can transcend our petty everydayness to something more noble, but that that nobility does not have to be constructed on the basis of, of an enemy. Excellent, thank you, thank you. All right, friends, we are out of time. Uh, I think we need to let- Thanks everyone. Thank you, Greg, that was really terrific. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Greg. Thanks everyone. And Leslie, thank you for your note, if you're still there. <laughs> it's good to see you or hear from you. Mir, yeah. thank you very much for this opportunity and I appreciate the questions. If anyone didn't get a chance to ask a question, you can find my email pretty easily, send it to me. Thank Make you, Greg. Thank you, Mir. Thank you, Greg. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.